psychiatry did you guys get? Some? Okay. So some of this probably be review. But I love this. <laughs> The amazing thing is that this statistics is actually correct. <laughs> uh, that is the rate of, the men of mental illness in um, the U.S., one in four. So almost half the adults in the U.S. are going to develop uh, at least one mental illness during their lifetime. So, so when we talk about uh, psychopathology, we're talking about a mental disorder but we're also talking about mental distress or maladaptive behavior. And most mental health issues are not identified by a mental health professional, they're identified by you guys. They're um, the medical care provider. So I wanted to go over some of the disorders that you might be seeing in your um, clinics. So I'm gonna hit on anxiety disorders, mood, psychotic, somatic symptom disorder, autism spectrum disorders. Uh, substance use disorders, the dementias, and personality disorders. So let's start with anxiety. Of course, this um, includes you know generalized anxiety as well as the phobias, panic attacks, panic disorders, um, social and separation anxiety disorders. Characterized by excessive worry, it's difficult to control um, the features. Um, have to have a duration of at least six months for a full diagnosis. So the lifetime prevalence of anxiety in the U.S. 12.3 percent. Utah, 12.6. So we're right there, you know, with the rest of the U.S. Women are more likely than men. Average age of onset 21.3 years old. So what you might see in your clinic is that perseveration about things that may go wrong. Uh, the inability to cope, the intolerance with in uncertainty. So if you are saying you're not sure we're going to watch it, they have a very difficult time with this idea of just um, seeing what happens, it's that uncertainty. Difficult, difficulty concentrating, just the restlessness. Um, somatic symptoms, of course, we see the headaches, the gastrointestinal issues are the first, um, you know, that always are very much exacerbated by anxiety. Then we go into the mood disorders, and this includes, you know, not just depression, but mania as well. Uh, you know, of course, depression characterized by, you know, the sad mood, um, fatigue, uh, lack of interest in things that they normally found interesting or, or enjoyable, uh, differences, change in eating habits, sleeping, hypersomnia, or um, not being able to sleep, but insomnia. Um, of course, helplessness, hopelessness, worthlessness, the inability to make simple decisions, even between chocolate and vanilla. Simple things like that sometimes. And the presentation in some individuals is not going to be sadness or a low mood, but it may be irritability or anger even. And mania, of course, we're looking at um, really an irritable mood or feeling like they're on top of the world, they don't need to sleep. They're just um, go, 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 feeling super creative. It's really hard for people who are uh, bipolar to stay on their medications because they feel so wonderful in this stage. They don't like to, to take that to the top off of their hyper moods. So lifetime prevalence, 20.8% in the US adult population. Again, women more likely than men. But then we have to say, well, are they more likely to report than men as well? So we can only do with what we can, um, what is reported. Average age of onset is about 30 years old, um, which actually is a little bit older than I would have normally thought because we are seeing a lot of depression in um, young kids. There we go. So. Grief is no longer an excluder. My, my video is not loading. Ah, here we go. It's just slow. 
Uh, grief is no longer an exclusion in a mood disorder. Um, if, a, if it's meeting the criteria for the duration, it can also be um, diagnosed. And it, grief bereavement also um, responds to the same medications. So I don't know if you've seen grief giraffe. Have you? OK. Well, you're in for another treat, sorry. <laughs> you have to sit through grief giraffe again. based on Kubler-Ross's stages. Of course, they're not linear stages, so people go move back and forth between them, and sometimes they'll feel like they're not getting through it because they are, they've are they gone backwards rather than forwards, so it's important to tell them that, you know, it's not linear. It's not linear at all. So what you might, you might see in your clinics is that sad effect, tearfulness, that uh, psychomotor retardation, they're just moving slower, they're talking slower. I work with a man who is so slow that it's almost painful and it's all part of his depression. Um, and again, you might, they might come in where normally they're, they're well taken care of and their, their <coughs> hygiene is not what it should be. Um, mania, what you might see is that um, super elevated mood, they're overconfident, they're energetic, they've got um, pressured speech, they're super talkative, lots of ideas, like they can't hardly even get them out, they're coming so fast. So those are the things that you might see in your clinic. So it is important to assess for suicide. So some of the warning signs, of course, you know, they're, they're threatening. Um, and, you know, we do see this in the clinic, especially when you give them a diagnosis that is degenerative where they're, they may end up blind. Um, the, they're going to say, you know, well, life isn't worth living. I'm just going to go home and shoot myself. Unfortunately, sometimes it does happen. Um, so also, if they've got the means to hurt themselves, like they're an avid gun collector, um, talking or writing about death or suicide, that feeling of hopelessness, like there's no way that they can handle this. It's just totally hopeless. You know, and then there's the passive suicidality, where they're acting recklessly. recklessly. They're doing things that, that actually could um, endanger their lives. Of course, uh, increased use of alcohol drugs, withdrawing from people, um, that agitation. Actually, um, a mixed episode of mania and depression is the most risky time for suicide, because they do have the energy to actually um, complete a suicide. And then the uh, dramatic change in the mood. So seek emergency help here at the Moran. You can always call us in the patient support program. But when you are out um, away from the Moran in your own practices, um, you may need to call the police to just escort the person to the local ER where they can be evaluated for a, a mental health hold. Um, and then there is also the National uh, Suicide Prevention 
lifeline. So psychotic disorders. Psychotic disorders are, are my favorite just because I've done so much uh, research on, on in schizophrenia. It's, um, they are, to me, amazing what the, what the mind comes up with that is as real as, as this, you know, so. So that's including the schizophrenia spectrum disorders, of course, the delusional disorders, schizotypal, um, or schizotypal, depending on how you want to say it. It's said both ways. Uh, brief psychotic disorder and schizoaffective disorder. So the major disruption in the thinking to the point of losing contact with reality, uh, delusions, hallucinations, um, disorganized thinking, disorganized behavior, the positive symptoms and the negative symptoms, are you familiar with those in psychosis? Okay, those symptoms that are added to or taken away from, perfect. Uh, catatonia is now its own separate category, but it can also be used as a specifier in uh, schizophrenia as well, in the new DSM-5. So we still don't know the exact etiology um, for schizophrenia spectrum disorders. We do know that there's a genetic component, but we haven't been able to replicate the polymorphisms in, in different populations. So it may be um, a series of different um, etiologies to get to the same presentation. And of course then we also have the substance-induced psychoses so that don't always go away either. So the prevalence of all, over all the psychoses, about 2%, schizophrenia is about 1%, except for in genetic isolates. The onset of late teens, um, men presenting, or males presenting earlier, onset earlier than, than women. So that late teens, very early 30s is usually the time frame that they're gonna uh, present. Treatments, medications. Uh, of course, medications still have a lot of side effects. And of course, getting the antidepressants, the mood stabilizers, the anti-anxieties, working with them with cognitive therapy, social skills training, stress reduction, because we do know that you know a stressful event can bring on another episode, and then voc rehab so that they can um, maintain employment or get employment where they're feeling productive, and that all helps towards um, keeping them stable. So what you might see in your clinic, of course, the paranoid um, statements of persecution, talk of having special skills or a special mission, purpose, um, the appearance that they might be responding to internal stimuli. I, I used to work with a psychiatrist that said, and I don't mean needing to go to the bathroom, <laughs> which is internal stimuli, right? <laughs> so uh, hearing voices or seeing things that aren't there. Uh, you know, this kind of thing that presents. I, I did an interview on um, a woman who I would talk to her and she would engage and then she would look off to the side and do one of these and then come back and, and tell me something more. So she was obviously, you know, getting something from something that was not there. <laughs> so um, you guys know all about um, what I mean by, you know, um, the derailment, um, clanging, thought blocking. Those are all terms that are familiar to you. Okay, if there's not, I'll be happy to. Clanging? Clanging is like, they're going to be rhyming, oh well, hell, I fell, you know, those kind of, call it clean, yeah. The, so the symptomatic, um, somatic symptom disorders um, that we've kind of uh, covered a little bit a few, uh, about a month ago um, with the couple cases that were here at the Moran. Um, we're talking uh, also be besides somatic symptom disorder, the illness anxiety disorder, which used to be called hypochondriasis, uh, fictitious disorder, and then the all-out conversion disorder. So the characteristics of that are the physical symptoms that are very distressing or, the, or result in significant disruption of functioning as well as the excessive or disproportionate thoughts, feelings, and behavior regarding those symptoms, okay? So conversion disorder, is the only one that, um, that is considered a, a true uh, psychological problem. 
okay, brought on by some kind of psychological stressor or some issue that's not resolved. But the others, the DSM-5, when we changed from the four to the five, they made it very clear that um, they may be the result of an unknown physical cause, just that we haven't been able to diagnose it yet. And um, the reason for that is that they found a, a large proportion were later found to actually have a physical cause related to them. So the idea behind that was not, uh, that it wasn't felt to be appropriate to kind of blame individuals for a mental disorder when we just couldn't find the physical cause. Does that make sense? Of course, the term was coined by, by Freud. Um, conversion, having that conflict, trauma, um, psychological to physical. Along with conversion disorder, comorbidities, comorbidities that we see all the time, there's that depression, anxiety, personality disorders, especially histrionic personality disorder, going along with that. So, <clears throat> so this is what I was telling you about. Um, studies found that 25 to 50 percent of the diagnosed cases were eventually found out to have a medical condition. So that's why we're being very careful now. Um, with somatic symptom disorders, most common in adolescents. Um, most true cases will spontaneously resolve, but they can, uh, under times of stress, again, have a recurrent episode. So um, we can specify if it's acute or persistent, those kind of things. Confronting can make it worse. It doesn't help to confront. So um, psychotherapy, we focus on coping with the underlying conflicts that are going on and giving them some insight using CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, to be um, to give us that insight. Once you, it's like once you shine the, the flashlight in a dark area, you can't unsee it, and that's why it's helpful. So once they can start to see what the issue is that has created this in their life, things start to change for them. So this functional vision loss spectrum, I think, was great because it starts with the deliberate malingerer. It's like faking it. They know they're faking it to gain something, right? Whether it's disability, attention, whatever. And then you've got the worried imposter. Well, they think that there's something wrong, but uh, he's really worried that there might be a serious problem, okay? But he knows he's a little bit exaggerating. And then you get the, you know, the impressionable exaggerator. They know they're really going to make it obvious for you to find something wrong, right? <laughs> and then the suggestible innocent um, is convinced after some injury that you know they're going to be blind in one eye or that it's going to be worse than it than it truly may be. Okay. Autism spectrum disorders. We see a lot of uh, autism spectrum disorders. Of course, in the DSM-5, uh, we, we went from you know, listing out each one into putting them as a spectrum disorder, including uh, Asperger's, childhood uh, disintegrative disorders, PDD, those kind of things are all rolled in now with varying levels of symptoms uh, and symptom severity. So a lot of what we're seeing is the, the deficits in the social communication and interaction. Um, restricted or repetitive behaviors, a lot of uh, sensory uh, dysfunction, whether that be problems processing sensory from touch, auditory, visual, both either not, not um, wanting any, you know, the avoidant, or the staring at the lights needing more, so both ways. So along the autism spectrum, we can do things. Mm -hmm. We can do visual therapy for conversion, for depth perception issues, um, the poor eye contact, the difficult, um, typical visual patterns that they're good at looking through something rather than at it, people and objects, using their periphery rather than um, looking straight at things. You know, these are telling you other kinds of problems that may be, they may be experiencing. And actually, more than 70% don't really achieve that auto automatic kind of uh, binocular vision pattern. So they are in need of therapies. But because, well, you know, and also this, um, the prevalence, 1 in 88, um, 2012, 1 in 47 in Utah. 
Utah rates are high. There's some controversy over what the real numbers are right now, but they're still high, no matter what they are. So, oops, wrong way. Um, you've got a handout on how to work with an autistic uh, adult. <clears throat> and, you know, there's a, some people are fine with autist, uh, autistic, some people like autistic person, but they see it as more of a characteristic of themselves rather than a label. So it just depends on the person. There's no politically correct way of, of talking about autism yet that is universal. So one of the things that you should be aware of, because direct eye contact is so uncomfortable for people on the autism spectrum, an eye exam is excruciating for them to have to have somebody look straight in their eyes. So, and that's one thing that you should be aware of. The other thing is sometimes they have a hard time screening out everything around them. So if um, your, if the exam room has uh, lots of sensory overload kind of things in it, in order to really talk to them, you may need to, to move to another area that's not quite so busy. Substance use disorders. We no longer distinguish between abuse and um, dependence. Now it's all one set of substance use disorders. Again, you know the, the, the criteria, the tolerance, the withdrawals, using larger amounts over a longer period of time, uh, wanting to quit and not being able to, uh, the cravings, um, and then continued use even though it's creating problems in their lives. So those are just kind of some of the things. So the substance abuse disorders, you know, there's a huge cost to that. If you take in um, lost work, the crime, the whole ball of wax, $740 billion annually in just the U.S. So it's a huge problem. So of course what you might see is the smell or obvious uh, somebody's high. <laughs> Um, what we've seen a lot is these injuries sustained while they were, you know, super drunk or whatever. We've had people fall off bicycles. We've had people, you know, um, just found, they have no idea what happened to them. They're found on the floor or whatever. They've obviously fallen or something and had some kind of injury. The drug-seeking behavior, of course, um, this is when they are seeking a specific substance. And then they won't let you substitute. There's like oh, I'm allergic to that, or it doesn't work, or whatever. But they know their pharmacology really well. <laughs> um, and then exaggerating medical problems in order to get the, the, um, the opiates rather than, you know, Tylenol. And when you, if you feel pressured, they're usually drug-seeking. That kind of, you know, kind of check in with yourself. What are you feeling? Um, I put in a simple four question, the RAP4 um, handout. If there's an answer to yes, it's simple questions to ask somebody that you, you know, when you suspect there may be an alcohol issue, that they may need treatment. Very simple to go ahead and go through those and then refer them on to needing some help. Did I go the wrong thing? Okay. okay. Um, so, of course, the treatments we can do intensive inpatient or outpatient treatment, 12-step programs, relapse rates are high. This is an addiction. Uh, relapse rates are very high. But what to do is to do treat them with uh, dignity and respect. Um, changing use habits is not easy. And even when abstinence isn't even an option, just cutting down is something, okay? And then, of course, uh, encouraging them to get the appropriate professional help that they help that they need. Okay, the dementias, um, including strokes, um, Alzheimer's, metabolic diseases, traumatic brain injuries, Parkinson's, Huntington's, all of those infection, infections of the brain, spinal cord, anything that um, is creating this neurocognitive disorder. So the estimates, about 2 million people in the U.S., another 1 to 5 million, of those 2 million have the severe form, another 1 to 5 million have a mild to moderate form. Um, 
over 70 years old in 2010, the prevalence was about 14.7%. And the risk of developing develop the dementia doubles every five years after age of 65. What did Betty Davis say? Old age is no place for sissies. <laughs> so this is an, an image of a healthy brain versus advanced Alzheimer's. So the, the physical changes is very sad what's happening. So you've also got a handout there um, about working with people with the patient that has dementia. And you know, being reasonable, rational, and logical will just get you into trouble. <laughs> Straightforward, simple sentences is what is going to get the results. Um, don't ask them if they will take the eye drops. Tell them. If, they, if you ask and they say no, then you're stuck. You know? <laughs> if you say you will take these at, you know, three times a day, simple, direct instructions work best. Um, you also have a mini st mental status exam. This is one that we use all the time. Um, here at the Moran, you can always call us. We're happy to come down and do it for you. Um, out in your private practices or wherever you end up, you may want to take that with you just in case you uh, just file it away and just in case you need to, to um, do a simple little mini mental. You can even take just parts of this. Uh, we'll kind of give you an idea if you need to refer the person on. Personality disorders. So these are the impairments um, in personality, self and interpersonal, the functioning, um, and the presence of the pathological personality traits. These are stable over time. <clears throat> it's that enduring pattern of thinking, feeling, behaving. Um, and so the pre prevalence of <clears throat> any personality disorder nine to almost 15 percent of the population that have a diagnosable personality disorder. We see traits in almost, oh, everybody's got traits, let's face it. But we do cluster them, A, B, and C, familiar with these. Cluster A are the odd and eccentric ones, paranoid, schizoid, schizotypal, schizotypal. Um, schizotypal, um, you get a lot of magical thinking with that. It might not be quite to the uh, level of a delusion, definitely magical thinking. Cluster B, those are the dramatic, emotional, or erratic. Um, we see more of these. Uh, Antisocial. Um, that, you know, you we can trace back a true diagnosable antisocial behavior going back to, uh, you know, the early teens. That's why we're asking about, you know, um, cruelty to animals and fire setting and things like that. Those are all those kind of things that are the early precursors to it, to antisocial behavior. Borderline, that unstable interpersonal relationships, um, black and white kind of thinking. You're either a hero or you're a villain. There's no in between. It's, it's also marked by impulsivity. The histrionic, that excessive emotionality, attention seeker, everything's larger than life. Um, everybody's their very best friend. It's just kind of a histrionic personality. And of course, narcissistic, and we all know, um, we all know somebody <laughs> who qualifies for this, actually, so. But this pattern of grandiosity, that need for admiration, and the, a true narcissistic personality, not just traits, but a true narcissistic personality, has a very difficult time with empathy, putting themselves in somebody else's shoes. So in cluster C, these are the anxious or fearful ones, the avoidant personalities, the dependent, that excessive need for care, for care um, leading to that uh, submissive or clingy behavior, and of course, uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, not obsessive compulsive disorder, um, which is more of the perfectionism, those kind of things, that preoccupation with order and interpersonal control. Love this. <laughs> repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, OCDs are 
kind of termed the, um, the self-doubter disease. Did, did I turn that off? <laughs> did I check that? I better check it again. Did I really check it? I better check it again. <laughs> So in a comprehensive um, assessment, you know, recognizing that often psychiatric mental health issues are co-occurring with mental medical problems. Um, you know, one of the perfect examples of that is chronic illness and depression. They go hand in hand. Um, so are you including in your assessment of the eye conditions the also the idea, the degree to which the patient's thoughts, behaviors, feelings are connected to their condition. Are they disproportionate? Are they excessive? Um, and if you recognize how the, um, the patient's thoughts, feelings, and behavior are, are impacting their functioning, then you can refer them on for more focused treatment, which will only help your treatment plan for them to, to succeed even better. <coughs> So, awareness is tricky. Give it a minute to load. My videos are slow in loading. There we go. Okay. So, watch carefully. This is an awareness test. Passes does the team in white make? The answer is thirteen. Did you get thirteen? Okay. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Did you see the bear? It is easy to miss something that you're not looking for. So, attention can be very selective, and as you're looking for something, you may miss other information at the expense of, of trying to, to find what you're looking for. Um, I also use this example a lot in therapy with people of, you find what you're looking for. So if you have a negative mindset, you're looking for the negative in life. If you have a positive mindset, you look for the positive, and guess what you find? You find the positive. So. People with psychopathology in your practice? <laughs> it's, it's never just one thing. Mm -hmm. So, it's important for individuals, all of us, to, to recognize that you know mental illnesses are real, but they are treatable, and people can and do recover. So having a conversation with somebody that you might believe is having some mental health issues, it's important to approach the conversation with respect and dignity. This is something that happens to all of us to some extent or another uh, at some point in our lives and not to be uh, like blaming of that. And then also, you know, talk to them about what they can do. You know, there's a variety of mental health professionals that can help or substance use professionals that can help, but there's also so much that they can do for themselves as well. You know, are they taking care of themselves? Are they, you know, getting their exercise? Are they eating properly? Are they getting sleep? You can't cope with anything, including a, you know, a serious eye problem if you're not getting enough sleep. Um, relaxation, meditation, there's peer support groups, you know, we offer uh, the support groups here at the Moran for our patients. They are amazing. I've seen some really wonderful changes in people that came in just absolutely in despair. And after going through eight weeks, 16 weeks, you know, sometimes they'll think, Amy has a, a core group of people. She does a support group for eight weeks, and then she takes one week break and then starts it again so new people can join. So it's a closed group. They get to really bond. And so they can continue on if they want. And she's got a core group of people that have continued on for more than a year. And it's amazing the differences in their 
um, outlook. Um, it's, I can't even stress that enough. So that peer support that they get and being with other people that are going through similar things, very, very helpful. Also, any kind of self-help books based on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, we're finding that that is the most um, widely um, researched and evidence-based therapy for many, many things. Not everything, but many things. And then also having that support system, that network of people that they can call on when they need to. You know, whether it's family, friends, their faith, um, whatever kind of social network, making sure that they have that. So, a little, another aside. And there's my references. So thank you for getting up early. <laughs> and thank you for paying attention, even though it was kind of a review for you.